Uno che seguiva. Uh, ok. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, there will be one fact and one opinion in this talk. Uh, and the fact is, so I will just let the people in. All right, guys, this already started. Oh, people, people on the back. This, in principle, already started. There is nothing on the, black, on the screen, but that's just a detail. OK, thank you. So, uh, so this is going to be a, lit, a little bit different uh, with respect to other talks, uh, uh, mostly because I'm not a, a member of this community or only marginally interested in the aspect of bacterial physiology and uh, uh, metabolism and ecology. But nevertheless, the purpose of this talk is to provide the one fact and one opinion. And the fact is that uh, there exists a coherent, well-developed mathematical and algorithmic framework to address decision problems in complex and dynamically changing environments. Okay? So this is the fact, and uh, I will not task myself with the purpose of giving you all the details of this mathematical construction, but just to provide you a sort of uh, uh, map of the landscape, of the kind of questions that people ask and find solutions for in different contexts. Uh, and the opinion is that this framework to address decision problems in dynamic environments, uh, my opinion is that this could be a very useful language and toolbox to address several questions in uh, uh, microbial physiology and microbial ecology. So I will sort of try to give you the basic concepts and ideas in, that pertain to this framework and of course let you do the work of uh, making your own opinion whether it, this is potentially useful or not. Okay, so uh, let's start with the something that we would call the theory of decision processes. So there will be very little mathematics, uh, like I said, but uh, a few ingredients are necessary, and, but they are very simple and easy to understand. Uh, the the main uh, concepts that make up a decision process are uh, three. One is called the environment. The other one is called the agent. And what separates the environment from the agent is an interface. And this interface is where all the exchanges between agent and environment take place. And these exchanges take typically two forms. One form is a, a sensory exchange. So there is information flowing from the environment to the agent. And there is a second exchange that is a flow of action in which the agent executes actions that have an impact on the environment, might have an impact on the environment. So the uh, environment is characterized by a quantity, a vector, unspecified object, which characterizes the state of the environment. Might be a very huge dimensional object so far, okay? Uh, Another key thing that I, uh, I need to tell is that everything takes place in time. So in 
the most general case, we are interested in this process doing something over time. So the counterpart of the state of the environment, which is something external to the agent, is an internal state of the agent, which we label by the letter M. The choice of M is not in coincidental because we also mean it to be a memory. It's everything that is inside the agent and plays the role of a memory. I will outline the formal setting very briefly and then sort of we'll try to understand what kind of things might mean in a biological context. Uh, and like I said, the exchanges between the interface uh, and between the environment and the agent occur through two objects. Okay, so this is called the state. This is called the memory. This will be called observations. And this will be called actions. Uh, so given a certain state, an observation can be made. Okay, so this is the process which we could call sensing. And given a memory and an observation, an action is taken. So this is properly what we would call the decision. or the control. As a result of the decision made, the world can go on to a new state as prime at the next instant of time. So this might be at time t, and this might happen at time t plus 1. At the same time, the observation is encapsulated in the new internal state. Okay? So this information is processed somehow, and together with the action, these are collected and manipulated. There is a computation process taking place here that gives a new internal state of the system and so on and so forth. So this is a very abstract and high level description which uh, makes sense because this kind of abstraction comes from uh, uh, the merging of different ideas coming uh, from animal behavior, from human behavior, from psychology, from neuroscience, from operations theory, that is the theory that tries to give a mathematical description of how factories work or how you do logistic, logistics, uh, but also from uh, 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 control theory and engineering, okay? So it's a sort of uh, way of encompassing all these kinds of approaches into single mathematical language. Uh, but for instance, just to give you an idea, uh, there are two examples that might be sort of, might be resonating with uh, your interest. One is uh, if we think the agent of a cell, as a cell, then the environment might be the chemical environment outside the cell. The process by which the environment is sensed might happen through receptors. Uh, and these receptors might interact with the internal machinery of the cell, kinases, which respond to the binding of the ligand with the receptor by changing the internal state, changing the phosphorylation level of several downstream effectors. Uh, the actions that are taken, the decisions that the cell make, can also affect both the environment and the internal state. And so also these are kept. There's reason to keep track of them. The reverse situation is, for instance, when you try to manipulate uh, a chemostat or a turbidostat or a bioreactor. In this case, the environment now becomes uh, 
the cell culture, and the experimenter or the engineer is uh, the agent, which uh, observes certain concentrations or certain levels of uh, optical density, and according to this, might decide to manipulate, keeps records of the observations, changing things in order to, for instance, over time, optimize the yield or, okay? So, this is the crucial point. You have to ask yourself, can I frame my problem as a decision problem? Yes or no? If it's no, you can go and take a coffee now. If it's yes, to some extent, then the second exercise is how do I connect these abstract concepts with the things I'm interested in? And once you succeed, everything else is downhill, more or less, okay? In the sense that there is, like I said, a framework, which, which I will try to give you just a glimpse of, uh, that can address questions like uh, how do I extract information from these things, so what are the constraints, what are the things that I can do and cannot do, and more importantly, if I couple this problem with the, the notion of some objective, how do I optimize my decision making in view of these objectives? And what I mean I, what I do optimize is how do I find optimal solutions and what are the techniques and what can I do in several different conditions, okay? So this is a, Outline. Mathematically, and this will be really the last uh, few equations that I'm going to write, uh, there are some objects that describe these arrows. So one is uh, a transition probability from the previous state to the new state given the action. Okay? So all this framework is cast in terms of naturally stochastic uh, processes, okay? So noise is already encompassed uh, in, the, in the formulation. Second object is uh, how observations are made, okay? So what is the probability that I make a certain observation? Why? In my space of observations, which I need to have identified a priori. And how does it depend? probabilistically from the state of the external environment. So if this is a receptor and this is the outside concentration, this Y might be the binding state of my receptors, which could be zero, one, or if it's an allosteric receptors, zero, N, or whatever. And then there is another object, which is the probability of taking a certain action A given pair M and Y, okay, which you can think of, I'm making a decision based on the current percept, what I see now, a snapshot of the current situation of the environment, and some memory that I collected in the past. Another, just a second, I'll finish the sentence, and then uh, another example, for instance, in bacterial chemotaxis, you make decisions based on the current concentration and some integral memory of what you have seen in the past, which is expressed in terms of methylation level of the receptor. And based on that, you decide whether to run or to tumble, if you're E. coli or whatever. Okay? Question? What if E is not dependent on memory? Like, if the Y is not dependent on memory? No, yes, that's, that's uh, exactly uh, one of the key points, whether to, where to place the interface. Okay, so here Y doesn't depend on memory. It's something which arrives there. Everything else uh, is post-processing, if you wish. So if you desensitize your receptor, that's something that is the effect of memory, but you do it downstream, okay? So this part is really placed at the outer level of your pro information processing. Okay. You, you might make this thing as complex as you want in principle. Of course, then this will impact the way that you are able to do stuff properly. But there's no limitation in this. This object could be a very long vector which contains all the occupancy levels of all receptors, if you wish. But and then, then how do I encode how many there are? 
this is your choice about how long this, this observation vector is. But I can, I can change the state of the cell to have only one receptor, zero receptors, 100 receptors. OK, fine. Uh, in, in that case, you would have to modify this slightly in the sense that you would have to find a way to back react on the kind of observations you make. That's, that's your yeah. regulation of that's the number the of receptors. That's the point. I don't know how to separate the Y from the M. Yeah, you could uh, tweak uh, the arrows here in a way to include this as well. But for simplicity, I'm sort of drawing the simplest diagram that you, that you can handle. But you could tweak it up appropriately. Uh, OK, so uh, the, the last thing is this uh, uh, process here by which uh, your new memory is generated possibly stochastically from the previous memory and the new observation that has come uh, into the game. OK, so um, in general, there is a distinction between uh, uh, this part, uh, which is typically assumed to be a property of the external environment. So it's not something that the agent has sort of control over. Okay? Whereas this part is the part where the agent is susceptible of uh, performing an optimization. So the idea is that there is a way to change parametrically these probability distributions. How do I decide things and how do I process the information that I receive in a way to optimize a certain goal. Okay? So here this is the first uh, important uh, fork uh, because there are two different uh, approaches now. One is which I would call modeling. So modeling is the agnostic viewpoint in which you say, okay, I don't know what my agent is actually uh, interested in doing. I, I'm only interested in collecting data about my system. Now I, I've identified what, what all these things mean. I can collect data and I construct uh, by modeling this probability distribution starting from observations, okay? So this is the agnostic viewpoint which was very well uh, expressed by our previous speakers who said, I have no idea whatsoever what cells want to optimize, and that's it. Uh, the, on the other opposite end of the spectrum, there is the point of view of optimization, which of course is everything but agnostic, is a strong a priori bias. Uh, it's principled in the sense that I have an opinion about what the system is trying to achieve. And uh, uh, if I assume that in a sort of top-down approach, uh, and I will show you briefly how to do it uh, uh, mathematically in this case, uh, if I assume that, then this provides me with a principle and then I can turn all, crank, all the cranks, start all the machinery, and come up with predictions of what would be the optimal behavior of the system and then compare it to what I see. Okay? Here, you have to take a stand. It's, uh, what I will discuss in the following is this part. But of course, this first part is also interesting because you could ask yourself questions about, given this framework, how do I extract information about these things in this language uh, through inference, to that analysis, etc. But I will not dis be discussing this question. One there, one there. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to the agnostic approach, uh, even then you are making some demands of the system, right? You are expecting the system to follow certain rules, for example. And so don't you make a priori assumptions. Yes, on. of course you do. I mean, so would... how do you differentiate between the assumptions that you make in an optimization scheme and an in and at in this, a... as so far, just I, I'm seeing be, a certain behavior and I made assumptions about how to describe this behavior in terms of these objects, and these are strong assumptions. You say well, my memory 
is made of the phosphorylation state. My observations are the binding states. My state is the concentration. Okay, these are clearly strong and delimitating assumptions. But then I'm not making any assumption about whether the system is optimizing this behavior towards any objective. This is an additional step that I have to take. Okay. Is there some way to mathematically, let's say, reverse engineer the optimization problem? Like, let's yes. say. Yes. Answer in 22 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, if we focus on the optimization principle, we have to add another piece uh, to this picture that is, uh, what is the objective function that we want to optimize? And uh, uh, the largest part, but not all, of, the, uh, of this decision process theory focuses on maximizing an object which is uh, based on uh, another, yet another uh, quantity which is called a reward. Okay, so at every step of this process, there is another scalar quantity called the reward which quantifies how good was your decision process in this step? Okay, so it's something that occurs on a very short time horizon, from one time step to the next. And the goal of the optimization process is to maximize the expected cumulative reward in the future. Okay. So if you are at any given instant of time, given your decisions, there will be a trajectory in this uh, abstract space of uh, external and internal states, and you will be collecting a sum of rewards Maybe the reward will come only at the very end of your process, many steps ahead. So this, the fact that you can encode for long-term rewards makes the problem extremely challenging. Because short-term rewards, you will behave greedily. But long-term rewards require planning, require some sort of uh, ability to forecast what will happen in the future as a consequence of the actions that we take now. Okay? And it's also expected because everything is stochastic, so you have to sort of nail this object down to a real variable and you take expectation values. In the end, I will also comment on how to go beyond this. Okay. <laughs> yep. So, in principle, I should expect also to minimize the variance. This, yeah. takes, this is something I will address in the okay. end. This, this is a so-called risk-neutral approach in which you care only about expectation values. I will comment in the end if I ever arrived there uh, about how do you deal with uh, uh, variance and uncertainty. Very good. So um, a few facts about uh, this scheme. So like you mentioned, the way that these objects are constructed, the choice of your state space, the choice of your memory space, how this objects can be parameterized or written represents or represents constraints. So all of this is part of the more general framework of constrained optimization. And of course, constraints will affect the kind of answers that you, that you have. Second remark, uh, you can distinguish policies, decisions in uh, reactive, reactive policies depend only on the current observation. And memory-based policies are the more general ones. Reactive policies are in general suboptimal. Okay, they achieve much less than what memory-based policy would do, which is sort of a general exp explanation of why you should have some sort of computation and processing inside the agent. But there's one important exception, 
is that when, if the observations are the states themselves, so if you see in full the external environment, this is called perfect observability. Then, you can have an optimal strategy which depends only on your percepts. Reactive strategies can be optimal. So you can really ignore this. Why is that? Because if you observe the state, then the top part of this diagram is a Markov process per se. So you don't need to keep memory if, since your state is already predicting everything about the future. But this is a very special case. In this particular case, your optimal policy is also pure. In the sense that in every state, you, there is one specific optimal action that solves the problem, a single one. Whereas on the contrary, if the observation is only partial, The general solution of this problem depends on the memory and how it is encoded for information. And also, typically, you can have random strategies. Can be optimal. Okay, so this is a very important general message that whenever the observation of the external environment is partial and you cannot base your strategy on the full state uh, of the environment or the Markov state, then there can emerge random strategies that are optimal. Question? Uh, I was thinking about this, the, the part of maximizing the expected cumulative reward. So if you're accumulating actually the reward uh, a long time, so you need to keep a track of when you started doing that, right? Well, so, that, so, okay, there are different uh, classes of problems. Uh, there are problems in which there is a, uh, an explicit time dependence, in which, of course, what you will do will depend exactly on the time at which you start your process. That will be a non-autonomous non system. But there are situations in which uh, uh, the system is stationary, statistically stationary, okay, in which uh, the decision policy will not depend on the instant of time. Both of these can be addressed by these techniques with different. Okay, um, other remarks? <clears throat> I think that I'm um, done with this comment so far. Yes. Okay, so uh, how does one find the optimal strategies. Once this problem is defined, there is a very well-defined mathematical question. Find what is the best way of acting in this setting. And you could do this by keeping the memory fixed. You can do it by including the memory as part of your optimization process. But nevertheless, there is a clear defined question of optimizing over some set of parameters that describe these transition probabilities in order to achieve the best outcome in terms of uh, cumulative rewards. And when you do this, there's actually uh, a further classification to make, uh, which uh, I, maybe I'll try to keep it uh, here, if I manage. So you can divide uh, very different situations uh, in terms of uh, two different uh, components to your problem, um, which uh, are roughly expressing your level of uh, epistemic knowledge a priori, if you wish, 
and your level of observability. So what is the epistemic knowledge? Is how much that my agent knows about these things. So does the agent have a, an accurate model of what happens outside? Or it does not? This model of the external environment in higher organisms might be something that comes from evolution, might be hardwired in the genetics, or might be something that has been learned during development and then put to the test into a specific task. Okay? The point is how much of this a priori knowledge is available to the agent in the decision process. And this clearly sets a very big difference in how you try to solve this problem and the techniques that you use. When you know a lot about this, this would be the direction in which you say you are working on a model-based setting. Because the way you try to optimize this problem, we rely on your knowledge of this. How the impact of how accurate the model is is a problem in itself, but let's discuss the situation in which the agent has a perfect knowledge of how the world works exactly. And this would put us on the far right of this diagram. Otherwise, on this other side, there is what is called a model-free situation, in which at this extreme, you have no idea whatsoever of how the world works. And of course, in order to optimize in this context, you will not be able to rely on a priori knowledge, which you will have to replace with empirical knowledge. Okay? So on this side, it will mostly be a problem of computation. So, given this input, the problem of finding optimal policy is a problem of planning. These are the inputs, the outputs are the optimal policies. It's just a problem of computation. On this other end, It's more of a problem of learning. Data come in, and from starting only from data, from experience, you will have to find the best behavior. And typically, this is done by algorithms that reflect the common idea of trial and error. You start, you try something, you get some feedback, you update, and you control, and you improve. And in doing so, you construct projections and estimates of what will be your future. If the outcomes are satisfactory or uh, optimistic or pessimistic, you change accordingly. And these algorithms, which uh, are based on this principle, provide a way of optimizing without knowing how the model, how the world works, just by interacting with it. And of course, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in between when you have partial knowledge about some aspects of the model, so maybe you know how your receptor works, but you don't know how the world changes. How do you deal with these hybrid approaches by a mix of techniques that come from the two extremes? Along this other axis is the notion of observability. At the top, you are in this situation where you truly see the states. This is the perfect observability setting. You work directly with the perfect knowledge of the environment. There is no filter through sensory systems that throws away information. Or if it filters, it does so in a way that it keeps all the relevant information. And here at the very bottom is a situation where the system is totally unobservable. unobservable. Okay. You just move around in the dark. Maybe you can keep track of your own actions, in which case you still can do non-trivial stuff. Okay. An example from biology, is what is called depth reckoning or inertial navigation. Uh, even without knowing where it is in space, an insect can know how far it was from the initial location as a vector just by integrating velocities or accelerations along its trajectory. Okay, So you don't observe anything outside. You don't see where you are in a map. 
you just see your own actions and then by integrating in time you can know where you are from your starting point. Okay. If you don't have access either to observations, contextual observations or actions, then you're totally in the dark and there's little you can do. And that's the bottom of it all. Okay, so uh, there are basically three extreme cases on which everything is built upon in this, uh, in this game. One is the situation in which you are the top right of this diagram. And this is where MDP, Markov decision processes live. In this upper corner of the diagram, you have uh, a way to compute the optimal policy given the fact that you know how these two things are. And in particular, since you're perfectly observable, you know that your observations are exactly the states. So in this upper corner, the key tool is a, an object which is called the, the Bellman's equation, optimality equation which per se is a nonlinear vector equation, which you can solve by a variety of techniques. But probably most interestingly for you, uh, there's a way of rephrasing this Bellman's equation through linear programming. Okay? So this top right case in which you have perfect observability and perfect knowledge of your model, you can solve by linear programming. And this will give you the optimal actions in every context you find yourself. So what happens if you move down along this axis? So you still know the model, you still know this, but now the observations are partial, as it all, almost always is. Then you enter the realm of what are called the partially observable Markov decision processes. Here, you can still solve the optimality. By techniques which are more complex, the Bellman's equation in this case becomes, which was a nonlinear vector equation, it becomes a nonlinear functional equation, much harder to solve, but still solvable. The key trick is that uh, in order to solve these PMDPs, you can use Bayesian inference Understand how the memory collects information about the observation. So if you hear, you say that your memory is the belief, so which is the probability distribution over states. So rather than knowing where the state is, you have a memory which keeps a probability distribution over what could be your hidden state. And in this case, POMDPs are just controlled hidden Markov models. So there's a hidden Markov model which is taking place here. The state change, they are hidden, but there are observations coming from these states, and you want to control this problem. In particular, if, for instance, if you make assumptions about uh, the statistic of these, if these things are all Gaussians, then this boils down to very old stuff in engineering about control of Gaussian processes, etc. So it's a subcase. So in general, uh, if these are, are your MDPs, for instance, stochastic optimal control is a subclass of this, and optimal control theory is a subclass of this. So for those of you who have some ideas about control theory, for instance, Pontryagin principle for solving optimal dynamical system is just a special case of the Bellman equations which comes from this wider concept of MDPs. So it's in this sense that this kind of framework tries to gather several different approaches into a common language. And in the end, this is the where the real things happen, in which you have limited knowledge about the laws that govern your world and limited observability. So this is what is called the full 
reinforcement learning problem. And here, of course, the necessity becomes to uh, express all these objects in a way that is sufficiently rich to encode for the structure of your problem and sufficiently flexible to be prone to optimization. So I have zero time to go into the details of this, but just to give you an idea, these are what the kind of algorithms that people use to train uh, artificial intelligence to play video games or table games or the game of Go. Okay, so these objects combine ideas from these different things together in a way that I'm not able to express. But the main message here is that uh, there is a way to systematically overcome the limitations that come from partial observability and partial epistemic knowledge by using data to find the optimization. But what I want to do in the last five minutes that I have or so, 10 minutes, okay, is to, um, first of all, to check if I didn't miss anything here, but it doesn't seem the case, uh, to list uh, uh, things that go beyond what I've just described to you. And that are, most of them have already very solid, some of them are still under development, but I think they, uh, they bear even more interest to problems in bacterial physiology and, uh, uh, and ecology uh, to this case. So let me um, use uh, probably, again, this part of the slide. Of this of the blackboard. So item number one risk sensitive. Okay, so what I forgot to say is that uh, uh, this ensemble of techniques that generalize the decision processes to a situation in which you don't have partial observation and uh, uh, um, partial knowledge is, goes under the name of reinforcement learning, mostly for historical reasons. Uh, and all the things I will discuss are extension of this basic framework of reinforcement learning. So, Risk-sensitive reinforcement learning is uh, what tries to address the question that this might not be necessarily the object you're interested in, the expected cumulative reward. For the reason that, like it was said before, you're not caring about variances. Okay? So if you're confronted, for instance, with two options, okay, in which you get, uh, I don't know, say $1, 10% of the times, and $100, sorry, the other way around. Zero dollars, 90% uh, of the time, and one dollar, 10% of the time. And you have confronted with the option in which you're given 10 cents every time. So if you're a human, and if you're a monkey, if you're a rat, you would decidedly tend towards the risk averse option. But they are indifferent from the viewpoint of maximizing the expected cumulative reward. So where does this ingredient comes from? Is that because in one case you have uh, some variance, some dispersion about your outcomes, and in the other case you have not. And how do you account for that? You account for that by extending this setting. And when I mean extending, I mean that this part will still part of a subclass of this to the concept of risk-sensitive reinforcement learning. For instance, what you set up to optimize is, for instance, you might want to maximize this is one of the possible mathematical translation of this idea. Maximize an object which is just one over A alpha of the logarithm of the expected value of the exponential of alpha, and this here the sum of rewards. Okay? So why is this a measure of risk sensitivity? Because if your alpha is positive, you will be very much interested in situations where you get a lot of rewards, and you don't care much when you get punished a lot. So alpha larger than zero will be favoring a, a risk-seeking behavior. But alpha 
less than zero will be a risk averse. And if you take the limit of alpha tending to zero, you get exactly the risk neutral case that we were discussing before. Now this is interesting in several respects. One respect formal is that this bears a similarity to notions like free energy in physics. But the second and probably most important thing is that this object is the exponential of something which is accumulated over time, so it bears a clear formal resemblance to notions like growth rate. Don't see how it could be because this includes the notion about the probability distribution where the. But, but you're still, now you're optimizing the expectation of e to the alpha. Yes, but these are, these are random quantities, right? They vary depending on your policy. Yes, but I could still say my, I call my new reward e to the alpha sum of the rewards. But this object will become a product of things over time, whereas this before yes. it was a sum. So yes. There is a multiplicative nature to this object that is not present in the purely. So why is that sum. not allowed? No, I'm saying it is allowed. It's a different problem. It has different solutions. Okay. Okay. If, you, if you use this parameter to tune your problem of decision making in which you had the varying outcomes or stable outcomes with this, you would come to different conclusions depending on alpha. And you would favor risk averse or risk sensitive. All else being unchanged. Distribution of rewards is always the same. Your objective is changing. But you cannot reparameterize one problem into the other. The solutions are radically different. Maybe more later. <laughs> OK. So uh, second uh, uh, extension. Adversarial. So in this description, you're trying to get, get the best out of a given environment. Okay, so this is fixed. Now, suppose you want to formulate the same problem against a class of environments. And these environments might be trying to rig the game in the sense that might, they might choose in which state to be, depending on the actions you make. And you want to sort of insulate yourself with respect to this variability of the environment, which could be a strategic variability. So another way to say this is you want to ensure certain robustness of your response, because you want to be optimal against a class of environments. And this is what technically is called adversarial reinforcement learning. And uh, there are algorithms for this, which uh, integrate and expand the kind of algorithms that are used in the classical uh, single environment reinforcement learning. Uh, the note that I want to make uh, with respect to adversarial reinforcement learning is that uh, uh, there, are, there is a class of uh, these algorithms of adversarial reinforcement learning algorithms that formally map into the replicator dynamics. So it seems at least superficially that uh, uh, when you deal with an unknown environment and you have to sort of choose a strategy that does its best against this class of environments in a subclass of problems, you find that this can be mapped formally into the dynamics, which we know makes sense from uh, evolutionary slash ecology standpoint, which is sort of a tantalizing uh, uh, remark. Other extensions, uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. This is a, against an extension of this, because this was sort of a game against an environment. This is a game in, uh, against other agents, against, against or with other agents. Might be cooperative, non-cooperative. So in this extension, there are several agents, and each agent has its own reward function, which depends on the environment and what the other agents do. 
So in this sense, multi-agent reinforcement learning is an extension to game theory. So that you can provably show that there is a subclass of these multi-agent problems which gives you the setting of game theory. Matrix game theory, state-dependent game theory, rec uh, sorry, repeated games in, in case you incorporate for memory, etc. Question? Yeah. Uh, so maybe I missed this, but uh, what I understood is that you go from state S to S prime be because of the action A. My, might possibly depend, but it, the environment could change independently of your actions. Ah, OK. It's That's a possibility. What, OK. This also includes for the possibility that you are making changes to the environment, but uh, it's perfectly OK if you consider a subclass of problems in which it goes by itself, or it's even stationary. OK. All these are subclasses of that. OK, fine. Um, and specifically, when you use techniques from the single agent and you let agents play one against each other, this is exactly the kind of techniques of self-play that are being used in the applications that I was mentioning before. Another item, uh, multi-objective. So since the reward is a scalar function, here you have a single objective. But in many situations, you would like to know how the system behaves with respect to vectorial objectives, which of course, in general, do not allow you to find uh, an optimal solution uh, unless you're able to sort of order these uh, vectors uh, in some, some way. Otherwise, if you cannot order them, uh, then you have all, all the world of multi-objective optimization with Pareto frontiers and et cetera. And all of this has been extended to reinforcement learning as well. One common technique is the one that is the most obvious, that is to scalarize your vector of rewards. You combine them together with coefficients, and out of a vector, you make a scalar. And all the coefficients that appear in this scalar are expressing the trade-offs between the various things that you want to optimize. So you can, once you scalarize a multi-objective problem, you can use it with the same techniques here. And then you can study how it behaves as a function of the trade-offs parameters. Okay, so this also might have applications. The key point is that you can do, depending on your system, you could do this analytically or you could do it in a data-based way, which is sort of the upshot of the reinforcement learning part of the decision-making process. And then last but not least, there is a thing which is called inverse reinforcement learning. which precisely asks the question that you would expect. If I observe a certain behavior, can I infer from my observations what was the reward, what was the objective? So this is a very ambitious, ambitious question, as you can imagine. It's a sort of something that we naturally ask when we see a behavior. Okay, well, but what was the purpose of that? Uh, this is an ill-posed question in the sense that for any given behavior, optimal or not optimal, but even if it's optimal, there might be different reward structures that give the same result, okay? There are several examples that you can think of, but it's clear that uh, there is an infinite possibility of choosing the rewards, which sort of collapse onto the same uh, kind of optimal behavior. So how do you get out of this ill-posedness? Well, you make recourse to concepts like the Occam razors. So, and you ask yourself, oh, okay, but what is the simplest possible structure of the reward that would explain this behavior? So if you combine this idea with the maximum entropy approaches, then you have effective algorithms that are able to disentangle the rewards. So typically what you do, you start with a vector of possible rewards. Okay, so my system cares about growth rate, but it also cares about uh, 
costs, uh, metabolic costs, but it also cares about time to completion, but it also cares, and I compile a list of them. Then I scalarize them, just the way I do in multi-objective uh, optimization. And then I run my maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning approach to sort out what would be the best explanation of all these trade-off coefficients. So starting from data, there is a way, systematic way of answering to this kind, this kind of questions using techniques. And with that, I think I'm done. Happy to take questions. There is time for a couple of fast questions. Uh, thanks. This was very nice getting a refresher on control again. Um, I was wondering, is it feasible to think of sort of a cell in these different states that it can have as sort of an MPC on reinforcement, that the objectives, depending on what I have and my memory, actually updates the objectives continuously over time. Okay, yeah. So this is a, yet another chapter, <laughs> uh, which pertains to another thing, which is called, uh, broadly speaking, reward shaping. Okay. So uh, in several applications, it's been shown that uh, you can improve a lot learning and performance in these algorithms by adding additional terms to the reward, which might favor, for instance, exploratory behavior uh, or uh, curiosity-driven behavior, and they, it comes under different names. So yes, the answer, short answer is yes, it's an art rather than a science to sort of uh, introduce the kind of uh, reward shaping that uh, favor your process of learning and optimization without destroying the structure of the problem. I was just wondering what was the opinion part that you mentioned in the beginning? That you should care about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you make your own. <laughs> All right. There are no more questions. Let's thank Antonio again. We are one hour late. <laughs>